The opportunities are there, but you got to reach out and pick them up. I feel lucky uh, that I fell into doing something um, that I feel really matters, you know, getting people information uh, around the world about anything. We're spending all our time trying to blame people and figure out why we got to where we are now rather than focusing on how you get out of where we are now and make it better. Want to be happy? Build a life, not just a business. Living that believe in life. Out here living that believe in life. Every day we living that believe in life. What's the luck we living that believe in life? Living life, yeah, so we grinding it out. Every single day we be grinding it out. What's the luck we living that believe in life for? That believe in life for? Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and this channel was created to help you overcome the number one challenge that is holding you back, a lack of belief in yourself. You watch these videos because you know you've got something more inside you. You've got Michael Jordan level genius at something. So today, let's live your best believe life and get inside the incredible mindset of billionaires. Enjoy. Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one. Learn from every mistake with Oprah Winfrey. It doesn't matter how far you might rise, at some point you are bound to stumble because if you're constantly doing what we do, raising the bar, if you are constantly pushing yourself higher, higher, the law of averages, not to mention the myth of Icarus, uh, predicts that you will at some point fall. And when you do, I want you to know this, remember this, there is no such thing as failure. Failure is just life trying to move us in another direction. Now, when you're down there in a hole, it looks like failure. <laughs> so this past year, I had to spoon feed those words to myself. And when you're down in the hole, when that moment comes, it's really okay to feel bad for a little while. Give yourself time to mourn what you think you may have lost, but then, Here's the key, learn from every mistake because every experience, encounter, and particularly your mistakes are there to cheat you and force you into being more of who you are. Rule number two, seize the day with Steve Ballmer. There's a Latin expression which I think is great, I love it, it was in a now very old movie called The Dead Poets Society but the line of the movie was carpe diem, seize the day. The opportunities are there, but you gotta reach out and pick them up. You've gotta grab at them. Some of you may have already done that at the U, in your classes, in other students that you met, in your extracurricular activities, but grab them. Don't be afraid to make a mistake, because you know what you can do if you grab the wrong one? Drop it and pick up another one. It's okay, seize the day. I think back of all of the, 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 the luck, but also the times that were in front of me to seize the day. I don't know what got me to drop out of business school and come to Microsoft. My parents thought I was a whack job. Neither one of them graduated college and they thought this was really a wild idea. I was lucky. I seized the day. Microsoft, one day some guys fly in from, from IBM and all of a sudden we figure out we could actually provide all the software they need for this thing that became the personal computer. People, Bill, Paul, they had the wisdom to seize the day when that opportunity presented itself. And yet when you think of all the opportunities, when I think back of all the opportunities I've had, the one that was most important was an opportunity I got in 1969. Sitting in my junior high school class, I was in a public junior high, not very stimulated at the time, and over the loudspeaker, they said that a well, private high school in our area that I'd never heard of was giving scholarship tests that weekend. I told my mother I wanted to take them. She said, that's fine as long as you get a scholarship because we can't afford to send you there. But that's really where I got switched on. Switched on in math, switched on personally, energized in a way that never, never could be turned back. And I am very thankful for that opportunity. 
Yes, there's a lot of luck in opportunity, but there's a lot of seizing the day. And I encourage you all to reach out and carpe diem, really seize the opportunities that are in front of you. Rule number three, give the best experiences with Mark Zuckerberg. There's this inherent conflict in the system though, which is, you know, are we trying to optimize newsfeed to give each person, all of you guys, the best experience when you're reading? Or are we trying to help businesses just reach as many people as possible? And in every decision that we make, we optimize for the first, for making it so that when, for the, the people um, who we serve, who use Facebook and who are reading newsfeed, um, get the very best experience that they can. And that means that if a business is sharing content that's gonna be useful for them, then we'll show that. But that means that if the business is sharing content that isn't gonna be useful for them, um, we may not show that because it's probably more important that they learn about their friend who had a baby and their baby is healthy. So that's an important guiding principle for how we think about this stuff. And as the, um, and as the products continue to develop, there's just gonna be more people sharing more things um, and we're gonna continue to try to do our best at, at showing the best things that we can, understanding that there's no way that we can, that a person will ever take the time to go through every one of the 1,500 things um, that are shared with them every single day. Um, so that's, but that's kind of how I think about organic reach. And um, you know, there are a lot of pages that are going, that are doing quite successfully and their organic reach is, is growing quite a bit because they're delivering content to people that they really want. Um, so if you're a business owner and you're thinking about how to use your free page on Facebook, I would just focus on trying to publish really good content that's gonna be compelling to your customers and the people who are following you. Rule number four, learn the money game with Grant Cardone. I worked at McDonald's, I got fired. I worked at a furniture store, I got fired. I worked in a car dealership, I was fired six times from the same guy. I just quit leaving. And uh, I've been fired so many times, I finally figured out how to get fired and keep my job. I mean, really. <laughs> so talent. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a sales guy because not because I wanted to. That was not something I wanted to do. Uh, my dad, my dad was a sales guy. My dad told my mom before he died, tell, tell those boys to learn how to sell. He knew he was going to die. And he's like, tell those boys to learn how to sell and they can go anywhere. Uh, I, I didn't know that. My mom didn't tell me that until I was like, uh, 25, 26 years old. And I had to take a sales job. She, she wanted me to be a more, a, a professional. Uh, so I went and got an accounting degree, got out of college. There was 25% unemployment. I didn't know it. I, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't know anything about sales. I didn't, I didn't go to college to become a salesman, but it was the only job I could get when I was 25 years old. It was be unemployed or take this job selling Toyotas. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know what a Toyota was. This is, this is years ago. Toyota wasn't even uh, a thing yet. And um, so I took this job that I didn't, I thought it was just going to be a temporary job. I said, okay, I'm going to do this for until I can get a real job. And that ended up becoming my career. I actually hated sales because all the jobs I had outside of McDonald's were part-time sales jobs. I sold clothes. Yeah, you know, I remember selling clothes. I'd sell, I'd sell an outfit. And I'd make six bucks on it. So kind of hard to get excited about six dollars, but it was six dollars more than I had, and I was trying to put myself through college and and pay for all kind of ridiculous things I was doing at the time. And um, I, I I leaned into the sales thing and started learning it. I was just shooting some material today for Cardone University. We we have probably without me over. Um, over promoting my own product. We, we probably have the most viewed sales training system in the world today. And I'm saying that not to brag, but to tell the viewer, this came out of a job I didn't want and didn't like. But when I leaned into it and said, hey, I need to commit to this thing because I'm just going to, I have to learn how to do this. I have to learn how to bring revenue in. And whether I liked it or not, I need to learn. I need to learn the money game. The money game starts with in accounting, and it might have been the thing I learned in accounting. As I sit here and tell you this story, because in accounting, the top. I remember studying financial statements in accounting classes. To, it was accounting, um, the principles of accounting. I thought I was going to learn how to make money. They, that, that's not what they're teaching there. But I remember there was on a page in the accounting book, the blue accounting book that I detested and hated. There was a page about an income statement, and then they would compare income statements of these companies. Well, the top thing of every page 
was income, revenue, or gross sales. And later, looking back, didn't know it then, but looking back later, I'm like, oh, that's the most important part of a company. If it wasn't the most important part of a company, they wouldn't put it at the top of the income statement. Yeah, that's true. On every income statement everywhere in the world, it doesn't matter whether you're in China or Chicago. The top three lines, they might be different words there. It, it is all describing gross sales, uh, revenue, revenue by department, uh, gross dom- domestic product, how much uh, revenue is coming through a country. That is what determines whether or not a household, a department, or a company is viable. And I had been fighting the top three lines of my personal financial statement, which everybody has one. And, and it's called sales. So once I leaned into it, boom, I started making money, man. It was, it was literally that simple. I'm going to learn how to bring revenue into my household. I was 25 years old, had no money, lived in an, uh, lived in an apartment. And my rent was $275 a month. I was late on it four times a year. Every three months I was late because I'd go up and down. And when I leaned into it, I was saying, hey, I made an extra $1,000 uh, when I was 25 years old. I'm like, wow, that was the most important money I've ever made in my whole life. Because it, it, it gave me an idea that I could control my income. Hey, man. Evan, how you doing, buddy? Good, how are you? You got a book coming out, don't you? Uh, you just came out. Where can people get it? Get it on uh, Amazon, easiest spot, built to serve, right there. Let's go, man. If you guys don't know Evan, follow Evan Carmichael. He's got a new book out, Build a Serve. Go grab it today at Amazon. There's a good dude right here. Rule number five, think independently with Ray Dalio. You do our calculations, and uh, we have a view that's very different than the rest of the world's view at that time. So the independent thinking... We had among ourselves different people who had different views and the ability to work ourselves through those um, was essential for us to being able to stand upside from the crowd. So I needed to have the independent thinking and we needed to work it through. And then even at that time, we had to have um, the fear of being wrong because you can never be confident that you're right in the markets. And so to place the bet, but to place the bet in a defensive way and to work out together um, the engineering. What, what, what I believe is that everything happens over and over again through history. The world operates like a machine. It happens over and over again. And that if you can sort of go above yourself and your circumstances and look down at yourself within your circumstances, within a historical perspective, and then have agreed upon principles. You know, principles are how to handle things that happen over and over again. By having that, um, it's helpful, and ours are just oriented around this idea of meritocracy, so it allowed us to have an independent point of view while being not 100% certain and, you know, to be defensive, and it allowed us to play that well. Rule number six, make a difference with Sergey Brin. The challenge of a problem or the importance uh, isn't that related to how likely you are to achieve it. And, and in fact, even when you go after a more ambitious goal, even if you fail to achieve that one, uh, all the side effects that come along the way uh, can be that much more uh, rewarding and significant in their own right. Um, and so, you know, I feel lucky uh, that I fell into doing something um, that I feel really matters, you know, getting people information uh, around the world about anything. Uh, I, I wish there was a way to convey that too, uh, you know, to the world at large. Obviously, all of you uh, already have this religion, uh, but uh, it's uh, very rewarding when you work on something you think is going to make a big difference. And uh, yeah, it's a little bit harder, but I think, uh, I think the passion that one might bring with it uh, brings so much more energy to that that you're more likely to succeed. And rule number seven, the last one before a very special bonus clip, is never look back with Michael Bloomberg. It's never been a day that I haven't looked forward to going into work, even the days I knew I was going to get beaten up, even the day I knew I was going to get fired. I'd never been fired before. I wonder what it's like. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's go find out. Yeah. And I've never looked back. I, I, I find it fascinating. People spend, and we're doing this in this country, we're spending all our time trying to blame people and figure out why we got to where we are now rather than focusing on how you get out of where we are now and make it better. 
and successful people look to the future and unsuccessful people look to the back, mm -hmm. look, look behind them. Now I've got a special bonus clip that I think you're gonna enjoy, but before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know, what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and what is your plan of action for the next week? The science says that when you just watch a video, you get motivated, you get inspired, you have a 35% chance of actually doing something and following through. That, Believe Nation, is not enough. 35% is not enough, we gotta do something. But when you get inspired by watching a video like this and then you create a plan of action, your chances of following through jump to 91%. And when you commit publicly, like putting your comment down below with your plan, it jumps to 95%. That's what I want for you. I want you to take action. Your dreams are too important. Your life matters. Your mission has to happen. So, question of the day, your biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week, put it down in the comments below and I'm gonna celebrate alongside with you. You haven't said that this is the thing. This is what I have to accomplish today. This is the mission that I am on and nothing is going to stop me. If you don't learn to focus on what's important to you, you'll never do important things and live your life reacting to what's important to other people instead. So I recently started a new business with one of my Thought Leadership Academy students, Jeremy. He came to my event last year. I was thinking about him on my tour this year and said, I wanna start a business with Jeremy around YouTube consulting. I get asked a lot, hey Evan, can you check out my channel? Hey Evan, can I work with you? Hey Evan, can I hire you for XYZ? Looking at my channel, giving me ideas, mentoring, guiding me. And it's just not the business that I wanna be in, but it is a business. And so I thought, Jeremy, Jeremy's gonna come on board, he's gonna do it. Now, when I recruited him and called him, he was not a YouTube expert. And I gave him the homework and said, listen, if you wanna do this business together, it's gotta to be important to you. I'm halfway through my trip on my tour. I'm coming back in a month and a half. Here's what I need you to know by the end of the month and a half. And I gave him resources, I gave him videos, I gave him insights and analytics and said, you need to know all of this. Know all of this. And then when I come back, if you're ready, we'll start the business. And he did. He focused, he made it his priority. He knew nothing about this, and all of a sudden he became an expert. By every day, all day long, grinding to learn. By, by researching everybody who is an expert at this, understanding their methodologies, their best practices, looking through all my videos, my thumbnails, my strategies, all the things that I've talked about in the past, digesting it, kind of like the Matrix, when Neo's in the Matrix and, and he now he can learn Kung Fu, and now he learns how to fly a helicopter, all of that stuff, that's basically what he did. And when I came back in a month and a half, I put him to the test and said, hey, let's do two free calls. We'll take two people from my community and say, hey, free, free call, let's go. And he blew me away with how much he knew because he focused on it. Here's a guy who went from knowing almost zero to now being an expert to be able to really help give value to people. And now when we're looking at new people coming in, I, I barely have to do anything because he already knows what I'm gonna say. He already knows, he's already done the work, he's done the research, because he spent that time on focused effort. And this is where I think a lot of people feel like they're never gonna win because you may not have had the expertise, you don't have the education. It doesn't take long to become an expert. It's just focused work that you're passionate about. Focused work, you could quickly become, in a matter of months, an expert at something if you just focus in on it and dedicate your life to that thing that you love. You can easily pass people who are experts at something who don't love their thing, but because you're willing to take it on, you're willing to absorb. Think about when you went to school, how much of the information you had in your head, but you had to read over the page four times. <laughs> so you're at the same page four, five, six times because you got lost, you got distracted. That's not focused work because you don't love that thing. I was wondering if you have any stock tips for any of the students, you know, we're, we're all trying to, uh, Make, make a little living? Uh, I, I didn't think they taught that at Georgetown. <laughs> they, no, they, the, best, the best investment I ever made, well, I, I bought a book in 1949 by a fellow named Ben Graham called The Intelligent Investor. I, I don't remember what I paid, but aside from what I paid for my two marriage licenses, that was the best investment I ever made. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, it's very important to have the right framework. You need. You need, you need to have an approach to investing that's sound. And, and Graham's approach is, is simple, uh, but some people uh, 
adopt to it, and, 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 uh, which I did immediately, and, and most people don't. Um, but if you have the right philosophy, you will find opportunities uh, as you go through the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And, and frankly, you're most likely to find them uh, when in periods like five years ago when we were having the panic. I mean, uh, stocks sell at silly prices from time to time. Most stocks at one time or another sell at very silly prices. Uh, and it doesn't take a high IQ to figure out that they're cheap, but it does take a temperament that's willing to step up and actually act. Uh, I tell people, if they're going in the investment business, if you got 160 IQ, sell 30 points to somebody else because you won't need it. I mean, that, <laughs> that, it, 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 I mean, I figured out very early, you don't have to be that smart in this business, which is fortunate, but you do have to have the right temperament and you have to be able to ignore what other people are saying and, and simply look at the facts and decide, is this stock which is selling at X worth 2X? And occasionally you'll find things like that. And if, when you don't find them, you don't do anything. So that's my generalized stock tip, no names. <laughs> you actually start a law firm and then practice law for some period of time. Well, I had no alternative. <laughs> <laughs> And then you actually I had an army of children almost immediately. <laughs> <laughs> I painted myself in quite a corner. Yeah. So zero choice is pretty powerful. Uh, yes, for sure. Yes, of course. So, so, so you practice law and then you leave law in the firm that you helped found and yeah. move over to investments. Well, but help, help that, us that, understand that. That, that sounds miraculous. <laughs> In fact, it was rather interesting. I probably got paid about $350,000 in my first 13 years of law practice total. And I had an army of children and no capital to start with. And when I chose this alternative career, mm -hmm. I had over $300,000 in liquid instruments. So. I had, and that was 10 years of living expenses. So I was not a courageous, venturesome, admirable man. I was a cautious little squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> Saving up more nuts than I really needed and not going very deep into my pile of nuts. And so that was, it wasn't that courageous and I kept one foot in the law firm while I tried my capitalist career. But as soon as the capitalist career succeeded, I intended to lift that second foot because I recognized that the potential of law practice, as I saw it then, I didn't anticipate the boom that came to the big firms. Uh, I just saw it as being more difficult. I wanted more independence than I was gonna have as a lawyer. I hated sending other people invoices and needing money from richer people. I thought it was undignified. I wanted my own money. <laughs> Not because I loved ease or social prestige. I wanted the independence. When I got to Dallas, I was a bartender at night, and I moved in. One of my buddies from Indiana said, you got to come to Dallas. And I'm like, I'm there. You know, my car would only get so far. It had a Fiat X19 with a hole in the floorboard that guzzled oil every 60 miles. And I went down there and there's a place called The Village. It's the world's, was the world's largest apartment complex. We had six guys in a three bedroom apartment. I didn't have my own room. I didn't have my own drawer. I didn't have my closet. I had a pile and I had one ratty towel that I stole from um, Motel 6. Um, and that was it. And so I was looking for my career, got a job at a software store. And I was, you know, I was, didn't have a tech background, so I was teaching myself all this. Because the way I look at tech is somebody invents it, and everybody else is tied for second place in the ability to learn it. And if, if I work harder and faster to really dive in, even if it means reading the manual, you know, just di diving in, then I can get a head start. How and old I can were you during I was this? 24. And so sleeping on the floor, working in a software company, you know, learning, 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 getting better at what I was doing. And then one day, because I was dying to get out of that rat hole that I lived in, um, I had a chance to go out and close a sale 
for that would have got me a $1,500 commission. And so I went to my boss, his name is Michael Humecki, and I said, boss, one of my uh, responsibilities was to sweep the floor, wipe down the windows, and open the door to open the store. I got the sale, you gotta let me close the sale. He goes, no, you gotta be in there to open the store. And I'm like, Michael, you, I mean, no. So I made the executive decision to go out, pick up the check, thinking if I hand this guy a $15,000 check, of course he's gonna change his mind. Fired me on the spot. And so here I was, living in a shithole, excuse my French, you know, just this ratty place with a Motel 6 towel, sorry, Motel 6, um, <laughs> and, and really didn't know how I was gonna get out, but I went to, I decided, okay, I'm a lousy employee. I went to um, one of the companies that I had been talking to, Architectural Lighting, and I said, look, um, I need $500 to be able to buy the software you want, and I promise you that even if it doesn't work, I will wash your car, you know, I will walk your dog, I don't care what it is, I will do whatever it takes to make it up to you. And they gave me the $500, and that allowed me to create micro solutions. And you know, six months later, I was out of the rat hole, and my company turned into a real company, and that's the one I sold um, for $6 million. Everyone thinks that Spanx actually started when I cut the feet out of my pantyhose, but the truth is it started many, many years before that. It started when I was selling fax machines door to door, getting kicked out of office buildings day in and day out, and I woke up one morning and I thought, I'm in the wrong movie. <laughs> How did this happen? This is not my life. Cut, scene, call the director, call the producer, no. And I took out a piece of paper and I wrote down what I was good at, and there was not much on the page. The word, I saw the word sales, I knew I was good in sales. So I wrote down in my journal, I want to invent a product that I can sell to millions of people that will make them feel good. And then I asked the universe for an idea. And I waited for two years, and the idea showed up. And the minute I cut the feet out of my pantyhose, I decided to pursue it. So, what do you do when you have an idea and you've never taken a business class or worked in fashion or retail? I wanted to patent my idea. And I ended up looking for a female patent attorney and I called the Georgia Chamber of Commerce and they said there actually wasn't a single female patent attorney in the entire state of Georgia. So I looked in the yellow pages and found three men's name and went out and pitched my idea to them. And they actually thought the idea was so bad that one of the patent lawyers later admitted to me he thought I'd been sent by candid camera. <laughs> Which makes sense because he was looking around the room for the hidden cameras. But he ended up eventually helping me. I went to Barnes & Noble, bought a book on patents and trademarks, wrote my own patent and went back to him and said, please, please, will you just write the claims portion of it? And he did for a discounted price. But it makes me think about inventors and innovators. And when you hear those words, do you think of women? Last year, my son had inventor week at his school, and they asked me to come and be the keynote speaker at his kindergarten class. <laughs> so, I was the uh, inventor that was coming, and I started out looking at all these cute little kids, and I said, so what does an inventor look like? And all their hands shot up, and one kid said, it's a man, and he has crazy hair. And somebody else raised their hand and said, no, 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 it's a bald man. No, it's a tall man, it's a short man. And I just stopped, and I said, well, I'm an inventor. And their eyes got really big, and they said, you are? And it dawned on me, I looked around the room and all the pictures of inventors were Albert Einstein, Thomas Edison, Steve Jobs, so I can see why the, the young girl who asked me and said I didn't know girls could be inventors was surprised. And even my son on the way home, he goes, Mom, you're an inventor? <laughs> <laughs> but the real point of all of this was I wanted to help women and I'm so passionate about it and it's amazing that I started with their butts and I've continued to grow. I started at the Sarah Blakely Foundation because I truly believe that the world would be a much better place if the male and female energy on the planet was more balanced. When God created this planet, he created uh, several species. Now, if you're an atheist, it's okay. Call it the force. Let me just say God for now, so I don't have to say God, the force, God, the force. Let's just say God right now. God creates a planet Earth. And first of all, he creates, which a lot of people in different organizations want a perfect social economic world where everything is free, don't worry about a thing, you're taken care of. 
There's no extra imagination necessary because it's all going to be given to you. So he creates the oyster. He says, oyster, I'm giving you a free house to live in. I'm calling it a shell. I'm going to put it at the bottom of the ocean to protect you from your enemies. You have food, clothing, all the food you want, protection, everything you want, the perfectly taken care of while you're in your measly little life as an oyster, but you're not going to go anywhere. You stay there at the bottom of the ocean, but you're totally got your free food, free clothing, free everything you want. Then God created something called the eagle. Eagle, whole different species. Eagle, you want a house, you go out and build it. Take the top of a mountain, take the top of a tree. Go out and build your own house. You want some food to eat? No problem. Go out there and find an eagle. And the eagle flies through miles in the wintertime of rain, sleet, snow, and wind just to feed its young. Did you know the eagle fails 95% of the time? A total failure. It's so big and cumbersome that when it comes upon its prey, they're wild. They shoot off in a different direction. And it misses. 5% of the time it succeeds. And what does it succeed to do? It succeeded to be the strongest bird in the sky. The only one that we know of anywhere in the world that could fly into the thermals of a hurricane and ride them to have fun. Now the eagle, unlike the oyster, can go anywhere it wants. Anywhere it wants. Yeah, it gambles, it does this on its own, but it goes wherever it wants. Now that eagle, and not the oyster, is the emblem of America, and also on the flag of many, many countries. You wouldn't be in this room right now if you weren't eagles. Don't only imagine, start doing it. Thank you. Peace, love, and happiness to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I talked a little bit about focusing the company. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, I want to talk a little bit about making some big bets. And, you know, we always try to concentrate on the long term, uh, what we're doing for the long term. And, you know, I think that, you know, uh, many of the things we started up that are really big now, like Chrome, were seen as kind of crazy uh, when we launched them. And so how do we decide what to do? What do you know, how do we decide what's really important to work on? Well, I like to call the toothbrush test. Uh, so the toothbrush test is, do you use it as often as you use your toothbrush? Uh, and for most people, I guess, that's twice a day. Raise your hand. Twice a day? Yeah. OK, most people. Uh, so I think you know, we really want things like that. And I think things like Gmail, obviously, uh, use much more than twice a day. Uh, and YouTube, you know, I think that uh, those things are amazing. And I think that, uh, you know, we look at things like YouTube, people thought, oh, you guys are never going to make money with that. You bought it for $1.4 billion. Uh, you know, you're totally crazy. And we were reasonably crazy, but it was a good bet. Uh, and uh, we've actually been doubling revenue every year on YouTube for four years. And uh, actually, if you're doubling things, it starts to add up pretty quickly. Um, even no matter where you start from. So I think that's a good example of the, how sort of our philosophy is that we see things that people use a lot uh, that, they're gonna, that are going to be really important to them. And we think that usually you can make money from those things over time. Uh, you know, a well-run technology business uh, can be monetized over time. When I started my business in 1995, it was very difficult. I had an idea, I invited 24 of my friends in my apartment because that year I went to Seattle, first time, my first trip to the USA. In Seattle, I discovered internet. And I think this thing in the future may change the world. So Tell I me about the encounter with the internet when you first saw it. Yeah, I went to the uh, Seattle and a friend of mine, he had a small office with like a four or five computers. I never touched computer in my life before because computer was so expensive to me and so complicated. But my friend said, this is internet. Just to type in whatever word you want to type. I said, no, 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 too expensive. I don't know which one to do. Even now, I don't know how a computer works. <laughs> so he said, Jack, it's not a bomb. Just to type whatever. So the first word I typed in was beer. B-E-I, beer, I don't drink, I don't know why I type of beer. I found American beer, German beer, Japanese beer, no China, so I typed the word China. There's no information about China. So I say, hmm, 
What if we can make some China information on the internet, let people know about China? So that was the idea. So I came back to China and say I want to resign from my school. You were a teacher. I was a teacher. I've been teaching in the university for six years. So I said、uh, I want to do it. I invite 24 of my friends to my apartment. After two hours of explaining what I'm going to do, internet. And 23 of them say, "Forget it." <laughs> He said, "This thing never worked because there's no such thing called internet in the world. You know nothing about a computer. So why you want to do this?" And、um, only one people. He said, "Jack, if you want to try it, just to try it. But if there's something wrong, just come back." And、uh, after a whole night thinking, I say, "I still want to do it." Because most of the people, they have a fancy ideas in the evening, but in the day, when they wake up in the evening or in the morning, they go back to do the same job. We have to do something different. So from there, I start my business, borrowing two thousand U.S. dollars from my relatives and friends. So that was the, my trip. I call myself like a blind man riding on the back of blind tigers. And those people who are expert of riding horses, they all fall down, and I'm still surviving. What advice would you have for you know, managers or companies that are really working through change and struggling? Let Let me、uh, define creative destruction, or I, I will use、uh, Schumpeter's definition. Here's the way he put it: It is not price and output competition which counts. But the competition from the new product, the new technology, the new source of supply, the new type of organization which commands a decisive cost or quality advantage, and which strikes not at the margins of the profits and the outputs, but at their foundations and their very lives. So that's what we're talking about here. This is. Not life or death for us individually, but life and death for our businesses and our jobs. And so, what we do to communicate this is get all our employees to understand that change is a risk for all of us. But not changing isn't a risk; it's suicide. It is a certainty. That you are going out of business, and you are going to—if you're an individual employee, if you're not changing and improving,、uh, and working on that every day—you're not going to have your job. Whereas, if you take what you think are risks, and you find a way to eliminate most of your job, because there's a way to do this more efficiently, or to bypass, do it a completely different way. Here at Coke, you're not going to lose your job. You're going to be a hero. When I started Amazon, it was 25 years ago. I started Amazon in 1994. When I went to seek investors, the first question I had to answer is, "What is the internet?" None of my investors had ever heard of the internet, and、uh, the, the, the 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 idea that I had in mind was to build a bookstore. I realized that we could build a store which would have every book. Ever printed in any language, in print or out of print, and we could do that online. It would be impossible in a physical store.、And、that was the founding idea of Amazon. And but did I expect what would happen today? No. You know, we started.、Uh, I've been at Amazon when it was one person, me, when it was ten people, when it was a hundred people, when it was a thousand people, and today, when it's you know more than seven hundred thousand people and approaching seventy thousand people just here in India. So, no, I did not predict that. And actually, I think if anybody had predicted that, they would have needed to be immediately institutionalized in a mental facility,、um, because it's not a normal thing to have happen. My dream when I started Amazon was that one day we might be able to afford a forklift. So it's been a very、uh, fun journey for me. And by the way, I still tap dance into work. I'm having so much fun. There are lots of times, especially in the early days,、uh, that were that were very very difficult. I think I think the most difficult thing experience I had was in 1990 when Oracle、uh, had its had its only loss quarter in history. And we've been in business for 20 years. Of those 20 years, we lost money one quarter. 
and we had a very difficult time because um, we, we had doubled our sales virtually every year for, for 10 years. Nine, nine out of 10 years, 10 out of 11 years. It was really quite an amazing run. We were the fastest growing company in history. Still, we're, still are the, you know, the fastest growing company in history over a long period of time. And suddenly we'd hit a wall. We, were, we would reach a billion dollars in revenue and we were having serious management problems all over the place. And the people who were running the company, the billion dollar company, were the same people that had run the company when we were a $50 million company, one twentieth the size. And I had an, had a, an incredible sense of loyalty to those, to those people who had worked with me to build Oracle. And it was a very painful realization in 1990 that I was going to have to change the management team, that the, that the company had outgrown the management, uh, that people who are good at running a $50 million company are not necessarily, those aren't the same skills. So they're just different. Not one is better or worse. They're just entirely different skill set in running a fifty million dollar company than a, than a billion dollar company, and uh, both skill sets are rare and precious. But we needed a different group of managers, and virtually the entire management team had to be replaced. And that means I had to ask people who I'd worked with for a decade to leave. I had to fire people, uh, and that was the most difficult. The most, the most difficult thing I had to do in, in business, asking the, you know, a bunch of people to leave Oracle. But I had no choice. I'd have to either ask them to leave Oracle or everyone would have to leave Oracle because there wouldn't be any Oracle left. So it was a, in that sense, it was a simple choice. Mm -hmm. It was uh, thousands of people worked at Oracle. Uh, they deserved the best leadership we could find. Uh, and... My primary, you know, my primary responsibility was to the company and all, all of the staff, you know, all of our shareholders and all of our customers. And uh, therefore, I, I had to choose. And if I couldn't make that decision, then I had to go. I want to offer a cautionary tale. And again, having both read your book and also the notes that you yeah. kindly sent me before this. Um, if you don't understand the subtlety here, you, you would conclude that the correct thing to do is to grow everything as fast as you possibly can everywhere, right? So let's just make as many engineers, as many salespeople, as many products, and so on and so on. Um, that completely does not work. And it doesn't work because no product shall ship before it actually works, right? And the way you build great products is you have small teams with strong leaders who obsess over trade-offs and they push things off and they say, we've got to get it done and they put a lot of pressure on the team and they work all night and they produce a product that just barely works. Okay, the original, uh, use non-Google examples, the original iPod just barely worked. Look at what it became. Try, tr people remember the original iPhone. No apps, mm -hmm. right? Everyone's forgotten that just barely worked, but it just was just the right combination to create an enormous franchise that's now 70% of the revenue of the world's most valuable company. Uh, I was talking to Travis Kalanick. Uh, we are uh, um, uh, major investors inside of Uber, so we have good relationships with Uber. And his description of Uber was that he understood scaling, but the product, the app wasn't ready. So. So you have to sort of have judgment about when the product is ready to scale against it. Okay. And um, so we, we would debate this over and over again. And so Larry and Sager would play tricks on me. So a typical example would be, I would say, we're not strong enough to take on Microsoft. And they wanted to do an operating system in a browser. And I said, there's no scenario where we'll ever do an operating system in a browser. And because Microsoft will kill us, and I don't want to get killed. We're a small company, and yes, yes, you're very smart, and yes, yes, we're full of smart people, and yes, yes, we have lots of revenue. These guys can kill us because I'd been previously killed in the previous jobs. And so they hired somebody to in, to improve the performance of Firefox. Um, six months later, I'm called down to one office, and this person who was supposed to improve the performance of Firefox has managed to invent Chrome. <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> And I say, well, how long have you been doing this? Well, I've been doing it on the side. No, you haven't. You've done it full time. Well, yeah, you know, I had three other people. Okay, well, how many more people do you have? Oh, 10 more people. Well, did Larry, okay, did Larry and Sergey know about this? Larry and Sergey encouraged it. I said, those assholes, right? You know, it's just, I knew it. I knew they were going around me, right? Okay? Yes. Mm. Um, 
So, and then I said, well, we can't do an operating system. So they bought this company called Android, and they said, yeah, yeah, yeah it's just for smartphones. It's, it's software for smartphones. Don't worry, Eric. Uh, <laughs> today, Android is 1.4 billion, op billion plus operating systems use, largest number of operating systems in the world. Chrome is the, lar the largest and most successful browser. So I, maybe the lesson to learn in management is I'm just wrong all the time. <laughs> but, but the secret was you, you, sort of, you, you have to have judgment as to when these things can scale. Right, and I can give you plenty of negative examples. Mm -hmm. um, an obvious one is Wave. Right, mm -hmm. it was a complicated email product that uh, we launched um, to great fanfare, and we watched its adoption rate. Marissa had this rule, which is a good rule, that you cannot at Google you cannot tell how successful a product is until the first six months, because what happens is you get this adoption cycle, and everyone loves the product because everyone tests it, and then you watch what happens. And the great products, you know, they're bumpy, but they go up. Well, this is what it looked like like this. So it took Eric, your friendly CEO, 18 months of going down straight down before that project was canceled, right? So again, lack of due diligence last. So I, the, the reason I'm answering your question in the, the, the blitz growth argument by saying you've got to have the products that you can scale. Yep. If you have the products that can scale, the thing that's new is you can scale very quickly. The Uber example. Yep. Once you have an app and a business model that more or less works, there's no reason why you shouldn't go global and wide. Or maybe I just blank out the word doubt. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, uh, no, I mean, I, to be totally frank, I doubted us too. So I, I thought we, uh, you know, had maybe, when starting SpaceX, maybe had a 10% chance of reaching orbit. So. So, you know, to those who, who doubted us, I was like, well, I think you're probably right, you know. Um, I mean, the number of times uh, that I, I was told, like, because uh, I was taking the money that I earned from, from PayPal and, and rolling it into to create SpaceX and Tesla and, and, and I was, ended up spending it all. It wasn't the intention, but, um, and, and, and uh, almost both companies went bankrupt. Frankly, 2008 was a tough year. Um, you know, it took us, took us uh, four attempts just to get to orbit with Falcon 1. Um, and uh, so, but a lot of times I was, you know, I, I, people would tell me this joke, like, how do you make a small fortune in the rocket industry? You start with a large one is the punchline. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I already heard that joke 12,000 times, you know? <laughs> so so um, anyway, um, and it, was, it, it almost came true. Um, you know, we, we just barely made it there, that fourth launch of Falcon 1. That's all the money we had for that fourth launch. And then, uh, it, and that wasn't even enough to, to save the company. We also then had to win the NASA cargo resupply contract. Um, so that, that came a little after, you know, a little, little bit later, or right towards the end of 2008. Um, those are the two key, key things that, that saved SpaceX. Otherwise, we would have, we would have, you know, not made it. So, um, so yeah, I think those those doubters were their probability assessment was correct, um, but fortunately, uh, fate has smiled upon us and brought us to this day. One time when you were doing hot air ballooning, uh, you weren't sure whether you would survive. With the ballooning adventures, I was doing something that um, that nobody had done before. Uh, I was, um, you know, trying to you know fly across the Atlantic or the Pacific or or go around the world in in a, in a balloon. I was flying at you know forty thousand feet in in the jet stream um, you know with one with one other person Per Lindstrand um, and uh, and you know the technology was completely unproven there were the, we were the test pilots that was more dangerous things could go wrong and they did go wrong but you set a number of Guinness World Records for that but in hindsight do you have any regrets about taking those risks <laughs> on the hot air balloon. It's interesting. Um, you know, my son and daughter now uh, are, are setting themselves big adventures every year, um, dragging their dad along on some of them. You know, and I think as a family, we feel, you know, live life, live life to its full. And, um, and you know, you, you can, uh, you know, you can, uh, you can you can die in a road accident. You can die on a, just a normal bike ride. Um, and quite often, when you're actually completely focused on an adventure, um, the, it's less likely in some way that you're going to die in an adventure because you're, you're, you're ready and sharp and, and know, know how to deal with it.
The biggest thing for me on that, on that path is I need, to, I need to draw something out and I need to get it out of my head. I found myself very early on thinking about something, like you know, thinking about this, this early idea for Twitter and saying to myself, I could build this awesome, you know, you, you have those like shower moments or you're walking at midnight in some town in New York City and you've got these amazing brain ideas. And, and then you start thinking, well, I could really start doing this if only X and if I had this person or if this technology existed or if this happened or this happened. And what I, what I realized I was doing is I constantly making excuses for not working on it. And then the window had passed and then I couldn't do anything. So I think it's really, really important um, to write it out or to draw it out or to code it. Um, but you need to get it out of your head. And the reason you have to get it out of your head is you need to be able to see it on a surface that is not in your mind. And once you can see it and once you can step back from it, then you can also decide, uh, this, is, you know, this passes my filter, passes my you know, constraints, so maybe I can show it and share it with some other people. And then they'll be like, ah, you know, that's the stupidest idea ever. And, or, you know, that's somewhat interesting, um, but maybe this and this and this. Um, so the sooner you can do that, then you have a lot of momentum around it and you can, you know, really decide if you want to commit to it and work on it more or put it on the shelf for a later date. And the realization that I think everyone needs to have about that latter option, putting it on the shelf, is that you can come back to it. And it'll, it'll surface back up in another piece of work or another idea at some point in your life. So, you know, having that, having that ability to close off a chapter and move on is really, really important. You can't have all these open threads. And, and that's what I realized I was doing. And, and that also encouraged me to, to really write more and to really think about, you know, what is, what is the story? What, how are people coming to this? And like when I show my friends this, how are they going to react? And I would write it down. I, I would actually treat it like a play. Uh, and, and, and when I realized that I was writing plays, I, wrote, I read a lot more plays um, for style and for substance and for technique. And um, I, think it's, you know, I, think it's, I think it's really good. And I think there's another company that I've always looked towards for um, inspiration. And uh, I know a number of people in this room probably have uh, a, this similar company in mind, which is Apple. Um, Apple, I think, is run like a theater company. Uh, it has a great sense of pacing, has a great sense of story, and has a great sense of execution. And it's all about, it's all event driven. It's all stage driven. The stage being a billboard, or the stage being a keynote, or the stage being a product launch. Um, all of it has a very, very cohesive end to end story. I mean, you think about, what happened when Steve Jobs came back to the company, the first thing he did is he killed every product line the company was working on. And for two, two years, they had no product on the market whatsoever. All they had were a bunch of posters all around the world with Steve's heroes. And it said, think different. And it was just focused on bringing up the brand and making people aware of the brand again and how the brand is aligning to this particular feeling and story. And then they came out with the iMac and then you know, built, built iTunes and then the iPod and they realized that, wait a minute, people are carrying music on their phones now so we better build a phone, build an iPhone. And so this, this unfolding of the plot and the epic story is, has been very, very interesting to watch, especially if you look back you know, to that, that time when he came back uh, to the company. So I've learned a lot from that company um, and other companies who operate in a similar fashion. When you look at it, you know, it is really not common for somebody to leave banking and go and start something totally new, you know, especially in an area of uh, events management. Because at the time that she left the bank, which was 10 years ago, uh, nobody thought that uh, something like events management will actually succeed. But I mean, it is good. That is what really what you call entrepreneurship and also a vision. You know, she had a vision and she uh, is able to actualize our vision. Uh, it's just like myself. I remember one time I went to uh, address a retreat of First Bank of Nigeria and I was telling First Bank of Nigeria, uh, this is where Dangote is going to be in the next five years. I mean, you know, we're not really that big at the time that I went there to address them. 
and I'm sure you know they couldn't really believe what I was saying then but I remember uh, at a point the MD said that well you know they are really shocked at how we actually been able to make it and also actualize our vision so I think with this thing that she has done I personally believe it is just beginning of the journey because she has a vision and I'm sure if she continues to do it, this can turn into another mega business, you know, because like what I always say, look, um, for an entrepreneur, there are no boundaries. Not only are there no boundaries, uh, you can actually excel much more than your own expectation. And that's really what I expect of an entrepreneur to be not to just say, okay, fine, I have a vision and only achieve that your vision. You need to have a vision and a mission so that you can actually actualize it and also excel. I mean, I had somebody uh, who came to interview me one time and I told him that, yes, you know, three, four, five years ago, I never ever expected myself to be on the Forbes list. But right now, the vision that I have and also my own mission is actually to be on top of the line, not even where I am today. And that's really how, uh, you know, a visionary person should be. My father started Reliance with a hundred dollars. Right? When I joined uh, Reliance in 1980, uh, the market value of Reliance was 30 or 40 million dollars. and in 30 years, right, the opportunities that were provided uh, by this country has enabled us to create wealth for India. My father was a big believer that any business that has the sole purpose of making money is not worth doing. Right? Business must serve a larger societal purpose. Reliance uh, raised all its money from capital markets and from individual small shareholders. So we've created a million millionaires just by investing in Reliance out of ordinary Indians. And that is the process of creating wealth for the country. Once you create opportunity, wealth comes. One of the things that really hurt Apple was after I left, John Scully got a very serious disease. And that disease, I've seen other people get it too, it's, um, it's the disease of thinking that a really great idea is 90% of the work. And that if you just tell your, all these other people, you know, here's this great idea, then of course they can go off and make it happen. And the problem with that is, is that there's a, just a tremendous amount of craftsmanship in, in between a great idea and a great product. And as you evolve that great idea, it changes and grows. It never comes out like it starts because you learn a lot more as you get into the subtleties of it. And you also find there's tremendous trade-offs that you have to make. I mean, you know, there are, there are just certain things you you can't make electrons do. There are certain things you can't make plastic do or glass do. And, and, and as you get into, or factories do, or robots do. And as you get into all these things, designing a product is keeping 5,000 things in your brain, these concepts, and fit, fitting them all together in, in, in kind of 
continuing to push to fit them together in new and different ways to get what you want. And every day you discover something new that is a new problem or a new opportunity to fit these things together a little differently. And it's that process that is the magic. Um, and so we had a lot of great ideas when we started, but what I've always felt that a team of people doing something they really believe in is like is, is like when I was a young kid, um, there was a, um, a widowed man that lived up the street. And uh, he was in his 80s. Uh, he's a little scary looking. And, and I got to know him a little bit. Um, I think he might have paid me to cut his mow his lawn or something. And one day he said, come on into my garage, I want to show you something. And he pulled out this dusty old rock tumbler. And it was a, a motor and a, and, a, and a coffee can and a little you know, band between them. And, and he said, come on with me. We went out to the back and we got some, just some rocks, some regular old ugly rocks. And, he, we, and we put them in the can with a little bit of, uh, of liquid and a little bit of, uh, of uh, grit powder. And um, we closed the can up, and, and he turned this motor on. He said, come back tomorrow. And his can was making a you know, racket as the stones went around. And I came back the next day, and we, took, we opened the can, and we took out these amazingly beautiful polished rocks. Um, the same common stones that had gone in through rubbing against each other like this, creating a little bit of friction, creating a little bit of noise, had come out these beautiful polished rocks. And that's always been in my mind, my metaphor for a team working really hard on something they're passionate about is, is that it's through the team, through that group of incredibly talented people bumping up against each other, having arguments, having fights sometimes, making some noise, and working together, they polish each other. And they polish the ideas, and what comes out are these really beautiful stones. Yeah. So it's hard to explain, um, and it's certainly not the result of one person. I mean, people like symbols, so I'm the symbol of certain things. But it really is a, it was a team effort on the Mac. Now, in my life, I, I observed something fairly early on uh, at Apple, um, which I didn't know how to explain it then, but I've thought a lot about it since. If you, most things in life, the dynamic range between average and the best is at most two to one. Right? Like if you go to New York City and you get an average taxi cab driver versus the best taxi cab driver, you know, you're probably going to get to your destination with the best taxi cab maybe 30% faster. You know, in an automobile, what's the difference between an average and the best? Maybe, I don't know, 20%? Uh, the best CD player and an average CD player, I don't know, 20%. So two to one is a big, big dynamic range in, in most of life. Um, in software, and it used to be the case in hardware too, the difference between average and the best is 50 to one, maybe 100 to one. Easy. Okay? Yeah. I've n very few things in life are like this, but what I was lucky enough to spend my life in is like this. And so I've built a lot of my success off finding these truly gifted people and not settling for B and C players, but really going for the A players. And I found something. I found that when you get enough A players together, when you go to, through the incredible work to find you know, five of these A players, they really like working with each other because they, they've never had a chance to do that before. And they don't want to work with B and C players. And so it becomes self-policing. And they only want to hire more A players. And so you build up these pockets of A players, and it propagates. And that's what the Mac team was like. They were all A players. And um, these were extraordinarily talented people. Six albums, original albums of your, of, of your own, a throne record, various records with good music to talk about, man. But seriously, Jesus, yeah. bravo, dude. I mean, that is one of the most creative records of, you know, of, of any genre I've heard in a very, very long time. And, you know, just in terms of your output, your most exciting sounding record, I think, man. Oh, thank you very much. You know? Yeah, I feel, you know, 
I was able to start just making exactly what was in my mind mm. again and not having to speak with the textures of the time. Because, mm. you know, Cruel Summer is definitely Kanye West and there's something kind of weird and off about Mercy, like when it has the high pitch, that type of sound. It sounds like art still a little bit, mm. even though it's obviously was a radio smash. Uh, but it's still, when when I, you know, get into the idea, like the trap drums and things like that, are certain, you know, songs that are blatant, you know, radio hits. It's mm. like I'm speaking with today's textures. Mm. And that's, you know, and you look, if you look at it 200 years from now, it's not going to stand out in the way that, you know, 808s or Yeezus mm. stands out mm. and completely can push or redefine or make people say, you know, hey, I, I completely hate that or I completely love that. But let me just think differently because everybody is like bound to these, you know, um, no pun intended. They're bound to uh, <laughs> 16 bars and mm. eight bars and, you know, the normal uh, radio uh the radio thing i was talking to frank ocean about this and said like you know my my mom got arrested for the sit-ins mm. and now we're more like the sit outs like sit off of radio yeah and say hey radio come to us yeah you yeah. know we need to find something new be because it's being you know controlled in a way and and, and manufactured in a way that you, you know uh really awesome you know artists you know uh can make amazing music and and, and that break as far past as mm. like something that's very like formulaic. So, so it almost feels like a duty to you in a weird way, having the people's yeah. ear, having people's attention and right. for, for, for great music to be able to say, well, if I'm not challenging them, if I'm not challenging myself, not challenging radio, what am I doing? Yeah, well, I, I'm not I'm not trying to regurgitate myself. I showed, I showed people that I understand how to make perfect. Mm. You know, dark fantasy could be considered to be perfect. You yeah. know, I say, I know how to make perfect, but yeah. that's not what I'm here to yeah. do. I'm here to crack and crack the pavement and make new grounds, you know, sonically and in society, culturally. You have uh, an enormous skill with branding and marketing and rebranding. Um, what, what would you give as advice to small and medium-sized business owners uh, for branding and marketing? Well, the first thing is you have to have a good product. If you don't have the product, forget it. But assuming they have a really good product, you have to get the word out. You know, I know people that are better singers, more talented than Frank Sinatra. You'll never hear about him. I know one in particular, a person who really is talented, always practicing, always rehearsing, and yet if the New York Times calls for an interview, no, 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 I'm not ready yet, I'm not ready yet, they're never ready. You gotta get out and do it. Also, you have to f sort of let the press know that you exist, getting good ratings on things, like I have golf courses that have high ratings, and then once you get the ratings, you gotta let people know you have the ratings. It's a long process, and it takes a long time. If you wanna get inside the mindset of a billionaire investor, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. You look at the most successful people in the world, I, I know very few of them that haven't had a major failure. The investing business you can learn by reading. You know, read everything Warren Buffett's ever written, watch every YouTube video he's ever appeared in.